in the 70 odd videos issued in this series. We have dealt with several mysterious shadowy figures about whom we know sometimes not even a name, unsure if they existed or if they were some necessary invention to make sense of a bewildering tale. Who was the slide guitarist on the platform at Tutwiler Station in Mississippi in 1903 who so entranced W.C. Handy? Who was Buddy Bolden and what kind of sound did he make that birthed an entire new music? Who was that lost to history figure of Teetot, the black street musician who taught Hank Williams to play the blues? Who were Gishi Wiley and King Solomon Hill, who made legendary records but left nary a trace of themselves behind? And who perhaps was the most legendary mysterioso of them all? Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. If Johnson had never existed, it would have been necessary to invent him. Even the name conjures up the darkest, most sulfurous pit of the blues, of the devil himself, of the dukes and the crossroads and of horrifying death, of the howl of the wind and the hellhounds baying. So what do we know of this spectre, this diaphanous figure with his piercing eyes and long fingers, this wanderer, this shriek, this shadow in the trees. As we progress, I, your humble narrator, will do my best to tell his story while relating to you what I believe to be his 12 greatest recording. Robert Johnson was born in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, a town of about 3,000 people, about 35 miles south of state capital Jackson on May 8th, 1911. He was raised, however, from a very young age in Memphis. This, of course, means, ironically, that Johnson was neither native to nor resident of the mythical land that he epitomized, the Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi Delta is not the Delta of the Mississippi River. That lies about 200 miles to the south. The Mississippi Delta is a strip of land about 200 miles long, by about 80 miles wide, which runs between Vicksburg in the south and Tunica in the north, and the Mississippi River and the Yazoo River or Highway 55, east to west. The center of the region is around Greenwood, ground zero for the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and in 1938, the site of the final engagement Robert Johnson ever played. We tend to define the Delta by its mighty throughways, highways 49, 55, 61, 65, 82, and 83, but these are misdirection. The key to the Delta lies in the back roads to take out of the old blacktop America and into a land where everything seems old, where time seems to become undone and the world turns in on itself. King Soybean doesn't ring like King Cotton and Tula and Dockery are now Monsanto and Conagra. Black Annie and the Freedom Riders are gone, Parchment is now the MSP, but every now and then you'll catch a glimpse of something. A tore down shack, a lone boxcar on a rusting rail by Old 61. Some snatch of silence in the vastness of the piercing blue sky and the unstinting butter yellow sun that brings us back to what we expect the Delta to be true or otherwise, but the Delta, as we imagine, is dead. The only thing that seemingly lives or grows in that thick, loamy soil is the myth of Robert Johnson. Johnson's childhood was not the textbook one of black poverty and depredation one associates with postbellum Mississippi. For one, Johnson's family had never been slaves in Mississippi. Robert's family came from freed blacks who'd been granted manumission in Virginia and North Carolina before the war. They'd owned property, but their circumstances later reduced to sharecropping and, shortly after Robert's birth, destitution. His mother, Julia, wandered through the Delta and Arkansas looking for work before begging to return to her now 
remarried ex-husband Charles, father of 10 of Julia's 11 children. He was not Robert's father. Charles, a skilled carpenter and cabinet maker, had been run out of Hazelhurst by a white lynch mob after defaulting on a mortgage payment and remarried a much younger woman in Memphis. Charles's wife, Molly, took pity on Julia and took them in, but unable to support herself, Julia shortly left, abandoning Robert to strangers. The Spencers, for Charles had taken a new name, did their best for Robert and eventually he came to accept them as the true family and took the surname Spencer. In Memphis, Robert enrolled in the Carnes Avenue School where he received comprehensive education. Almost all of his contemporaries who were raised either on plantations or worked the shares from a young age were taught only what they needed to know in order to pick cotton. Thanks to the schooling he got in Memphis and later in commerce, plus his voracious and lifelong reading habit, Robert was highly literate. He was also exposed to a much wider range of music as the Spencer House was just a few streets off Beale Street. Robert would have been well acquainted with the street performers, including Gus Cannon, Memphis Minnie and Frank Stokes, the circus parades which regularly came down Beale, and the Fisk University singers who sang in public parks. The excitement and sophistication of the big city lit a fire in Robert that led to his later rambling and thrill-seeking in his all-too-short life. Johnson was described as a slight man, about 5 foot 8 and 140 pounds. He was polite and softly spoken, and could have a temper, though, when he drank, which was often. He was gregarious and friendly, but protective of his secrets. When he played, he'd frequently turn his back on the audience or stop playing altogether when he felt someone that was observing and trying to copy his style too closely. He was envied for his ability to reproduce and extemporize a song after a single hearing. A fact not widely known is that he wore eyeglasses when reading. This was because of a transient cataract in his left eye, possibly caused by malnutrition during those lean years from 1912 to 1913. In 1920, Julia re-entered Robert's life. This must have been tremendously traumatic for Robert. At first, at the Rogers Plantation in Arkansas, and later at the Abbey and Leatherman Plantation near Robinsonville, Mississippi, Robert planted and harvested cotton. He hated it. A nine-year-old was expected to tote a six to eight foot sack which he filled with picked cotton. They say as a sharecropper, you work from can until can't. In 1924 though, a ray of sunshine as Robert re-enrolled in school. He was the only student in the school who could sign his own name and took your lessons from relatives on guitar and harmonica. In 1929, Robert changed his surname back to Johnson and married Virginia Travis, who died in childbirth shortly thereafter. Son House, a celebrated musician, moved to a house near Johnson's. House remembered Johnson as a passable harmonica player, but as a guitar player, he was so bad that other guitarists laughed at him. In 1931, Robert went in search of his natural father south to Martinsville, where he met a local guitarist called Ike Zimmerman, who schooled Robert up. He mastered Sunhouse's style and applied his own uncanny ear to learning other styles. He married Coletta Kraft in 1932, but abandoned her to go rambling and she died the next year. Johnson was what was known as a walking musician, a peripatetic mendicant who wandered from town to town, playing in the streets, at picnics, at weddings, and when bookings permitted, at juke joints. He was a famed womanizer in many towns. In Martinsville, once it said they locked up all of the single girls when Robert came to town. Not everywhere was as cautious, and there was a trail of little bobs and bobettes. Let's talk about the devil. The one thing most people think they know about Robert Johnson is that he went to the crossroads at midnight and sold his soul to the devil to become a guitar maestro. This, obviously, on its face, is bunk. What actually happened was that sometime between 1961 and 1963, Sun House was being interviewed by some earnest, folky journalist having been rediscovered as part of the early 60s folk boom. And House 
was quite irritated at the fact that um, every conversation he had with the journalist seemed to turn back to Robert Johnson. House knew as nothing more than an annoying kid. So House retold a much earlier story regarding Tommy Johnson, no relation, a bluesman who preceded uh, Robert Johnson and had since died, who claimed that he had been to the crossroads at midnight and sold his soul to the devil. That story, and with some embellishment from House and no doubt from the journalist, became the Crossroads legend. From 1932 to 1936, Bob lived the life of an itinerant entertainer, working a cirque between Memphis, Hot Springs, Forest City, Helena and Westover, whence, in the day, they ran a ferry into Friars Point, Mississippi, then back down into the Delta, across the northern Delta in towns like Tunica, Lula, Senatobia or Coahoma, then down Highway 61 revisiting Clarksdale, then into the southern Delta through Winstonville, Shelby, Cleveland, Dockery, Yazoo City, then Tonia and Vicksburg, then all the way down Highway 49 to Gulfport and Bogalusa, Louisiana. As Mississippi was still a dry state at the time and would remain so until 1966, Friars Point was a major offloading point for bootleggers and was consequently full of gin joints that Johnson could play in and ladies that Johnson could play with, a fact commemorated in Travelling Riverside Blues. Friars Point was a major locus for the development of Johnson's music and of his character. Johnson also rambled far further afield, visiting Kentucky, Chicago, St. Louis, Indiana, New Jersey and New York, frequently playing under aliases. According to Johnny Shines, who is not the most reliable of narratives, he also visited California and even Canada. In mid-1936, Robert sought out H.C. Spears, who was the talent booker responsible for placing many artists with record companies, although not Jimmy Rogers, who he famously turned down. Spears recommended Johnson to ARC Records, who arranged a three-day recording block from November 23rd to 25th, 1936, in room 414 of the Gunter Hotel in San Antonio, Texas. Terraplane Blues was released from these sessions and sold anywhere between five and 10,000 copies, probably more towards the top end of those figures. This ensured a repeat session in Dallas at the old Vitagraph Warner Brothers Studios on June 19th to the 20th of 1937. The San Antonio sessions were generally upbeat commercial material. The Dallas sessions were his more introspective material and probably had a greater concentration of his classic recordings. By 1938, the era of the solo bluesman was coming to an end, courtesy of electricity, largely. And Johnson found his travelling circuit was becoming reduced. He was also disheartened that his latest batch of records weren't selling. Planning to visit Yazoo City in Greenwood from his home in Robinsonville, he first consulted a doctor for chest and stomach pain. An ulcer was diagnosed, quit drinking was advised, and the advice was promptly disregarded. At first, his tenure in Greenwood was profitable, playing to large crowds in the street, enthusiastic crowds in the Dukes, and then finishing off at an all-nighter at a plantation Duke joint. He stayed for some weeks in Greenwood, finding the crowds and the ladies most convivial. One of the more convivial ladies in Greenwood was one Beatrice Davis, with whom Robert started an affair. Beatrice was the wife of one Ralph R.J. Davis, of the Three Forks Plantation, a resourceful and exceedingly jealous man. Gossip around town got back to RJ. His wife's weekly visits to her sister were in fact spent tarrying in Johnson's room. RJ swore vengeance. As Robert was booked for a three-night stand at the Three Forks Duke starting Saturday 13th of August 1938, RJ planned to dispense a little comeuppance to cockolding Bob. On that fateful night, RJ handed Beatrice a jar of corn liquor, spiked with naphthalene from mothballs. As fate would have it, Bob chugged the whole jar during a break in his set. The fact that RJ gave it to Beatrice would have indicated he wanted to poison both her and Bob, 
Fatal naphthalene poisoning is, however, very rare. There have only been nine cases reported since the Second World War. The chief effects are disorientation, nausea, vomiting, and violent, violent diarrhea. But Bob did have the ulcer and also suffered from esophageal varices. The naphthalene caused the ulcers and the varices to hemorrhage. At first, the patrons at the dance tried plying him with more whiskey, but that didn't help. So they finally took him to a back room and laid him on a bed to sleep it off. But Bob lay there moaning in pain. So some folks loaded him into a car and drove him back to his room in Baptist Town, which was a district of Greenwood. Alone, confused, and in terrible pain, Robert lingered for two days with a grossly distended abdomen and bleeding from the mouth. Eventually, on the last evening of his life, a plantation worker nicknamed Tush Hog. This was a common nickname given to men who had earned a leadership position in the plantation system, and they were generally men not desperate. Came into Baptist Town and took him back to his shack. Morning after arriving, the hellhounds finally caught up with Robert Johnson, and his varices ruptured. He died on the morning of August 16th. He was buried that day beside a pecan tree in an unmarked grave by the grounds of the Little Zion Church near the Three Forks Plantation. Through the thicket of trees lay the Little Tallahatchie River. Two days later, after his family arrived from Memphis and bought a proper coffin, he was exhumed and removed from the rude box he'd been placed into and reburied in his store-bought box.